Welcome back, everybody. It's your boy. Let's keep going today on our journey towards filling in all the gaps in the proof of Fermat's last theorem. We're going to look today at the basics of modular forms. So uh, let's start out by observing that if we let k be a natural number and f a holomorphic function on the complex upper half plane H and gamma with entries A, B, C, D, let's let that be a matrix in GL2 plus of R. So that's all the invertible two by two matrices with real entries and positive determinant. Then we may define the following gadget, f bar sub k gamma of z. It's just going to be the determinant of gamma over cz plus d to the k times f of gamma z. We define gamma z last time. It's action by fractional linear transformation. This f bar sub k guy here, this defines a right action of GL2 plus r in the space of holomorphic function on h. In other words, it takes in a holomorphic function on h, spits out another one. So what's a modular form? Let's let gamma in SL2z be a finite index subgroup. A modular form of weight k for this big gamma is a holomorphic function f on h, such that f is invariant under bar sub k gamma for all gamma and big gamma. And for every delta in SL2z, there better be a Fourier expansion for f bar sub k delta of z of the form sum over n bigger than or equal to zero a sub n q to the n over m for some natural number m. Notice I need my Fourier expansion to start at index zero. I don't want any negative index terms if I want to be a modular form. For modular functions, we didn't care. For modular forms, we do. We want holomorphicity. Because of the lack of negative index terms, the second condition here is often restated as f bar sub k delta is holomorphic at the cusps of big gamma. That's just kind of slang. If in addition, for every delta in SL2z, this first coefficient a sub zero actually vanishes. In other words, f bar sub k delta vanishes at the cusps of big gamma for every delta in SL2z. Then we'll call f not just a modular form of weight k for big gamma, but a cusp form of weight k for big gamma. If you like, uh, if you already understand modular curves and algebraic geometry and line bundles and all that kind of stuff, a more enlightening definition of modular forms is modular forms of weight k for gamma, a subgroup of SL2z are exactly the global sections of the kth tensor power of omega on the modular curve x sub gamma associated to gamma. We'll be defining this soon. Here, omega is the canonical bundle on this modular curve. OK, some notation and a quick remark. The vector space of modular forms, the complex vector space of modular forms of weight k for gamma is denoted m sub gay of gamma. And the subspace of cusp forms is denoted s sub k of gamma. I'd also like to make a quick remark here. The condition delta in SL2z in the definition of modular form can actually be replaced by delta in GL2 plus of Q by simply noting that you can take any matrix in GL2 plus of Q and write it as the product of an element in SL2z with an upper triangular matrix. And so then all the above theory goes through with this generalization here. Okay, how big, how big are these spaces? Uh, the spaces MK of gamma and SK of gamma by extension, are always finite dimensional. This is covered in Diamond and Sherman, for example. In fact, it follows from a powerful theorem known as Riemann Rock and the basic theory of holomorphic differentials on modular curves, which we'll actually be discussing soon. That if gamma is a congruent subgroup of SL2z, then the dimension of S2 gamma, so we can actually get a hold of this specific dimension of S2 gamma in a nice elegant way. And by the way, this space here is the space that is of primary concern. If you recall the proof of Fermat's last theorem, we're concerned mostly with weight two cusp forms. Anyway, the dimension of this space is always equal just to the genus G of the associated modular curve X sub gamma. And again, modular curves we'll be discussing soon. If you want a reference for this, um, I, Kirwan complex algebraic curve 6.3 covers it. I think it's covered in a variety of places though. Okay, the special case where we're looking at the congruent subgroup gamma one of n, which is the set of all matrices in SL2 that reduce to a uniponent matrix mod big N is of primary concern. Okay, so let's let gamma just be gamma one of n. We'll denote the associated spaces of modular and cusp forms for this specific congruent subgroup just by M sub K of n and S sub K of n respectively. If you give me a Dirichlet character chi of z mod n z x, so the group of units in z mod n z, a Dirichlet character is just a multiplicative homomorphism from this group to c star. 
will denote by m sub k of n chi and s sub k of n chi the subspaces, certain special subspaces of m sub k of n and s sub k of n respectively. These spaces are usually called modular forms with character chi or cusp forms with character chi. These are going to consist of f here or here respectively, such that f bar sub k of gamma is nothing but chi of d times f, where gamma is a, b, c, d, any matrix in gamma zero of n. And remember, gamma zero of n is just all of the two by two matrices in SL2z that reduce to an upper triangular matrix mod n. So it doesn't matter which matrix I pick, as long as it's in gamma zero n and has lower right entry d, then a modular form of level n associated to chi will be something that's a modular form in m sub k of n, but it also isn't quite necessarily invariant under bar sub k of gamma for gamma and gamma zero of n, but it almost is. It's invariant up to a twist by chi of d, we would say, okay? So in other words, these spaces are the chi eigenspaces of what we call the diamond operators. Now the diamond operators, they take a modular form f and they send it to what will denote f bar sub k times this kind of diamond operator, d diamond operator. What is this? Well, if d is in z mod n z x, so it's a unit in z mod n z, the diamond operator bracket d is defined as follows. So it's written f bar sub k bracket d. And it's very simply just f bar sub k times uh, of gamma, where gamma is anything in gamma zero of n that reduces mod big n to a matrix with d as its lower right entry. That's it. Now, of course, you have to make sure this is well defined, right? Because there's all kinds of matrices, presumably, that reduce mod n to a matrix with d as its lower right entry. But you see the map gamma zero of n mod gamma one of n to z mod n z cross given by just take the coset of some matrix and send it to its lower right entry mod big n. This turns out to be an isomorphism. And so the diamond operators do give a well-defined action of z mod n z cross on m sub k n and s sub k n. And then because of this fact, basic representation theory steps in and you can see this in Fulton Harris, chapter one, chapter two, you can see that m sub kn and s sub kn have eigenspace decompositions. m sub kn is the direct sum over all Dirichlet characters mod n of m sub k and chi, and s sub kn is the direct sum over all Dirichlet characters mod n of s sub k and chi. Okay, so this is this is good to know. If I hand you kind of a modular form for gamma one n of weight k, you know there's going to be some character associated to it. You know it's going to live in a unique one of these spaces. Okay. And then just as a quick remark, you can check easily if chi is the, just the trivial character, then m sub k n chi and s sub k n chi are nothing but m sub k gamma zero n and s sub k gamma zero n respectively. So they're, they're just the full space of modular forms for the congruent subgroup gamma zero n or the full space of cusp forms respectively. Okay. So thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next video. We'll continue our journey towards modular curves and towards all kinds of fancy stuff like Eichler-Shimura.